All right, so today we are taking a look at section 5.2, um, which is one of the most critical sections that we're going to cover the entire eight weeks. Um, this is definitely a place where if you're feeling like, okay, I get it, that's awesome, but make sure that you really, really, really understand the story behind things. Um, and if you're feeling lost, uh, it is worth your while 100% to really just dig in and say, okay, I'm going to commit to making sure that all of this makes sense to me. Um, it is stuff that we continue to use again and again. And I think the story part of it, like why all the things are the way they are, definitely play a huge role in helping folks understand um, what we're doing. Because otherwise it's just gonna feel like a lot of letters and a lot of nonsense. And I don't wish that upon anyone, okay? Um, I will say that I think some of us are Maybe we've had bad experiences with Trig in the past. Um, and some of us are really like finding that this is uh, like the second time around is really helpful. Um, but I also sense that there are some of us in this space who are kind of like, I hate Trig. I can't believe I have to take an eight week course on it. And we're just like letting ourselves continue to to be uh, traumatized by all the things we don't like about it. Uh, and, and I'm not sure that that's gonna be the best path to success, all right? So honestly speaking, I think it is worth sort of like reframing that mind to be like, okay, maybe I didn't get it the first time, but I'm like gonna try attacking the information in a different way, okay? So all of that being said, let's take a look at what we know. All right, so, so far we know that there are three main trig functions and three reciprocal trig functions. And then we've talked a little bit about something called reference angles. And since these are all gonna be things that we address today, I'm wondering if we can put into the chat what the three main trig functions are. So what are their names? You can go ahead and type those into the chat either directly to me or to the whole group where you can unmute yourself. All of those things are fine. All right, so yes, I would agree that Sokotoa helps us remember them, but they are indeed more precisely sine theta, cosine theta, and tangent theta. All right, perfect. And all of these, and I think I had us discuss that in the week one discussion, talk about like the ratios between different sides of a right triangle, right? But we also talked about something called reciprocal trig functions. And what do we have for the reciprocal ones? Let's start with tangent. What is the reciprocal function of tangent? Great, cotangent. All right, what is the reciprocal function of sine? A second. Cosecant, yeah, yeah, for sure, cosecant. And then the reciprocal function for cosine? Secant, there we go, there we go. All right, so we've got our cosecant, which we don't use the first three letters because otherwise it would end up looking like cosine, right? So we do cosecant. We have secant theta and we have cotangent theta. Beautiful, all right. So well, let's talk about reference angles and how those are gonna be, um, that concept is gonna be important today. So if we draw ourselves a quick picture, all right, so we've got our X, Y axis. I think last week we used the pink color for the initial side, and that does have to be where the initial side is. But if we think about a, an angle here. So maybe this is the terminal side, that purple one. And if we count in the positive direction, then we get that this is theta. But if we were to modify this diagram a little bit, all right, I'm gonna get rid of the thetas. And I'm actually gonna draw the purple angle sort of in this direction. And if we looked at the angle in a positive direction, we would count all the way from the pink to the purple line. But where would I label the reference angle? 
in this second diagram. And I'm going to just make sure that my, my settings are such that I th think folks can annotate on the screen. So if you want to annotate on the screen where the reference angle in the second diagram is, that would be lovely. All right, we've got one guest there in the purple. Anyone else? This is like you get to come up to the board, except you don't have to do all the walking. You just get to annotate on the screen. All right, so we've got two people who are marking off that same angle. That's actually what exactly what I was hoping we would do. Hmm, that's a good question. Hmm. Anyone who just annotated, maybe help answer that question. How do you annotate on the screen? Because as the host, my uh, my screen looks a little bit different than everybody else's. Basically, at the top, it says you're viewing Judy Wu's screen, and next to it, it says view options. You click the view options button, and you are given zoom room, zoom ratio, annotate, and exit full screen, as well as side-by-side -side mode. Then you click annotate, and you're given a bunch yeah. of options for what colors, thickness, size, all that. Cool, cool. All right, we've got three options. I saw a fourth person try a little something there. Okay, cool. So definitely a feature I wanna play around with a little bit more in this course, because I think we're gonna be looking at diagrams together and it's helpful even though I can't necessarily save things like it'll, when I move my screen, it moves, it doesn't, the annotations don't move with it. I think it's still a valuable exercise and like being able to engage in the conversation here. Um, but one of the things that we do want to note about reference angles is that a reference angle has to be between zero and 90 degrees. We could also say that that means it has to be between zero and what's the radian equivalent of 90 degrees? No, it's not pi. Pi over two, there we go. Remember half the circle is pi. So then a quarter circle, which is 90 degrees is gonna be pi over two, okay? Great. So if we look now at this definition, knowing that a reference angle has to be an acute angle, right, between zero and pi over two, as much as I love the contributions here, I would say that we would all agree those are not acute angles, right? And so one of the things I want to clear up about the reference angle is that the reference angle is between the terminal side and the closest x-axis. So even though this is x-axis over here, the negative x-axis is actually closer. So this angle here is going to be our reference angle. Okay, It's weird because we don't always go back to that initial side, but maybe we could make a note for ourselves here that it is um, from the terminal side to closest x, All right? It is from the terminal side to the closest x-axis, right? And that's going to be important for us today as we answer a bunch of new questions, okay? So thanks so much for uh, annotating here. I'm going to go ahead and clear those drawings, um, but you can also clear your own drawings if that's ever something you realize you drew something and it wasn't what you meant to contribute. You can always erase that. But what's new? All right. So today we are focusing on a bunch of questions, but they all have to do with something that even if you don't love it yet, even if you don't know what it is yet, it is something that I hope we all just embrace with open arms, all right? So we're gonna to answer today, what is the unit circle? And we're also gonna talk about why a unit circle, because I think a lot of times people just throw this unit circle at you and they're like, here, memorize this. But we don't really understand like how the numbers were chosen or why that particular um, 
method is something that will quote unquote make our lives easier. Okay, we're going to talk about where the coordinates come from, and then we're going to talk about how to use the, the unit circle. Okay, so being able to use the, the unit circle is going to be the biggest takeaway that I want us to have from today. But I think to help sort of support that reasoning, those first three questions are going to be super valid. Okay, so that's where we are headed for today and we are going to start off with this question does size matter okay so before we get to that let's take a look at this definition a unit circle by definition is a circle that is centered at the origin that has a radius of one so if i were to sketch a quick diagram over here Right, we've got a unit circle, okay, because the origin is at the center of that, and the radius is one. So any circle that is centered at the origin and has a radius of one, we would just call a unit circle. But let's kind of take a look at these three diagrams, right? We saw last week that we had different sized triangles. And even though the side lengths were different, right? Like this blue side length is clearly longer than the purple one and clearly longer than the pink one. And so even though we had a larger triangle, a medium sized triangle, and a small triangle, while some things changed, other things didn't necessarily change as much. And so I wanna do just a very quick overview because I think you folks did a great job last week really thinking about um, whether, uh, like how to figure out the different side lengths and ratios. So let's start with the purple triangle. And so let's call this angle theta right here. And I'm going to tell you, let's use some quote unquote nice numbers, right? So we're going to say that this side length is three and this side length is four. How long is the hypotenuse? Perfect. Three, four, five, right? And we can use the Pythagorean theorem, but if we sort of run those numbers in our head, three, four, five, three, four, five, three, four, five might save us a little bit of time there. Okay. All right, so sine theta, what do we get for sine theta? Perfect, three over five, because it's opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is four over five, because it's adjacent over hypotenuse. And then tangent is opposite, which is three over four, which is the um, opposite or adjacent side, okay? So those are things that, yes, we practiced last week, but we're gonna continue to use. And that want, that's something that we want to be really quick for us to figure out, okay? So we have all of these, but let me, let me add some other pieces of information here, okay? Let's say that this coordinate is zero, zero. So there's like an imaginary grid that this triangle is on. And I know that this is the origin. Can someone tell me what the coordinate of this point is right here? Four zero. Mm -hmm. How'd you get that? Well, if you start along the origin, then that means the four runs along the x-axis. And so it'd be adding four going to the right. Perfect. 
All right, and what do we get for this point up here in terms of coordinates? Okay. Mm -hmm. Four, three, perfect, okay. So we've taken this triangle and we sort of said, let's pretend that it's on this grid. And then if I had just given you those coordinates, I bet you could have figured out what those side lengths were, okay? So let's try the same game with the blue triangle, okay? So let's actually start the other directions. I'm gonna tell you that this is the origin and that this point up here has the coordinate eight comma six. Can you tell me the coordinate of this point down here? Nice, eight comma zero. Great. Now help me fill in the side lengths. How long is this side down here? Mm -hmm. Eight. What about this side, the vertical side? Six, great. What about the hypotenuse? 10, I love it. Um, Matthew, how did you know that so quickly, if you don't mind sharing? Multiplied by two. Okay, great. Right. So I had said like three, four, five is a good triangle to invest in, but check out what we did. We took three, we multiplied by two, we got six. We started off with four, we multiplied by two, we got eight. And so I love the reasoning here. If we have five, we should multiply by two, we'll get 10, we'll get the hypotenuse, okay? Now, real quick, let me ask you the same three questions. Sine theta, cosine theta, tangent theta. And what do we get? It will be the same as the previous example. Mm -hmm. And if we use the numbers we're given, sine would be six over 10, but like we did last week, we should reduce and we'll get the same thing. Same thing, cosine is gonna be eight over 10, but if we reduce, we get four over five. And then tangent, we get uh, six over eight, but if we reduce, we get three over four, right? So if we take a look at the two triangles we have so far, the size does matter when we're looking at just how long is a side, how long is the hypotenuse, how long is the opposite side, right? We need to know those as actual numbers. However, when we're thinking about the ratios of the sides, as long as the angle is the same, it's going to be the ratios of the sides will be the same, okay? So all of this idea of like taking a number and then reducing it to get what you want is sort of one way of looking at this, all right? But let's imagine that we had a triangle that is zero, zero. Uh, let's call this angle down here theta, like we did all the other ones. Um, and I'm gonna say that this point up here is one we'll figure out. But the one piece of information I will give you is that this hypotenuse is one, okay? And I'm choosing the hypotenuse to be one because then it sort of is like this line, which is, oh, I don't know, the radius of the unit circle. Now, I'm going to give you other information, too. I'm going to tell you that sine of theta equals 3 fifths. And I'm going to tell you that cosine theta equals 4 fifths. I'm wondering if you know that sine theta is 3 fifths, which side of the triangle 
can you give me a side length for? Wouldn't you technically be able to find the side lengths for both of the other sides since you know what the hypotenuse is? Mm, yes, let's start here though. Yeah. So it looks like Dallas says that we would be able to figure out the length of this side, the right side. Okay. I think three fifths. If we wrote it in a different way, we might make this idea a little bit more um, clear. So sine of theta is going to be the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Opposite side over hypotenuse. Then we can say that this opposite side has a length of three fifths. Okay. Using that same reasoning and cosine, how long is this bottom side here? We could write this as four fifths over one. Yes, and we could get the adjacent side to be four fifths. Great. put this up here. What is tangent theta? Good. Okay. I love both versions that we have here. We took the opposite side over the adjacent side. I think this is one of the reasons why some people find trig to be really challenging because the idea of dividing a fraction by another fraction looks really scary. Uh, maybe a skill that we never really mastered. And so having to use it in the context of another problem makes it really challenging. But tell me what rules you know about dividing fractions. Okay, be a little bit more precise. What are we flipping? Do we flip everything? Okay, so it looks like we can take the first part, the numerator, mm -hmm, and multiply it by the reciprocal of the denominator. Right. I know you folks have done this sort of work before. And I think that it's just weird that like, wow, we really have to use it again. And we do. All right. So it is something that we really want to be thoughtful about. Like, do we know how to do this idea of dividing fractions? But instead of multiplying out and making 15 over 20, Maybe a more efficient way of calculating this might be to notice that I have a five on the top and a five on the bottom, which reduce to one and I end up with three fourths. Okay. This trick right here of canceling out the fives before I multiply um, is a really helpful trick in terms of like keeping the numbers that you work with to be a lot smaller. Okay. All right. So back to this question, does size matter? I'm going to say yes and no. All right. Yes. This is four fifths. This is four. This is eight. Those are all clearly different triangles and different sized triangles. However, does size matter? Also, no, because Look at all of our signs. Sine is three fifths, sine is three fifths, sine is three fifths, right? Let's look at all the cosines. Four fifths, four fifths, four fifths, right? And the tangents, three over four, three over four, three over four. 
right? And so this is really where this idea of this unit circle starts, because if we choose a radius of one, that means we have a hypotenuse of one. And the sine value actually gives us this vertical sign. And the cosine value actually gives us the adjacent sign. So because we cleverly choose the hypotenuse to be one, we get a lot more information about um, the side lengths of the triangle. Okay. Now, before we move on, let's go back to this point right up here. What is the coordinate of this point? the x value comma the y value. Perfect, okay? So today, we're gonna to be looking a lot at cases like this, where we have a unit circle centered at the origin, and we're gonna be looking at the coordinates that are sort of at the top corner, because those coordinates are all on the circle, okay? And so all of those fractions that you see when you look at like a completed unit circle, they all come from this idea that if you have a hypotenuse of one, then you know the opposite side and you know the adjacent side, okay? So, There is a Desmos activity that is your classwork assignment for this week. So please go and do that one uh, this evening. This is triangles, two circles, right? I think it'll be a really good review of sort of like the story of what we're talking about. Um, but also in a way where you can sort of move things on your screen and kind of see like, Okay, as things are moving, what's changing and what's staying the same, All right? So as you go through this activity, consider, wow, ah, consider what changes and what stays the same. All right, so consider what changes and what stays the same. Um, great lens to look and sort of try and find patterns, okay? Um, if you have time to like meet up with someone else from this class and do the Desmos activity together, I think that's actually not a bad way to approach it um, because then you can kind of talk to each other about what patterns you see, okay? Um, you still do need to click undo your own ones, but it might be helpful if you're like, I never really know what a pattern I'm supposed to find, find a buddy and kind of do that together, okay? So let's take a look at um, some coordinates that I think are nice, quote unquote, on this unit circle, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and label the angles here first, all right? So I'm gonna label this one as zero degrees, which is also equal to zero radians. Um, I'm gonna label this one up here 90 degrees. And that is the same as we said earlier, pi over two radians. Uh, I'm gonna label this one, whoops, 180 degrees. And what can I call that in radians? Mm -hmm. We can call that pi. And this one down here, 270 degrees. And what can we call it in radians? Great. All right, these eight numbers that we just wrote up here, if we don't know them yet, I would encourage you to make that 
a reality for yourself as quickly as possible, okay? All right, now let me tell you, this is a unit circle. What does that mean the radius of this circle is? Mm -hmm. Radius is one. So what's the coordinate of that point? Uh, one comma zero. One comma zero, beautiful. All right, we're gonna skip to the next quadrantal angle, the one at pi over two. What is that coordinate? Beautiful, zero comma one, great. Let's go to the next quadrantal angle. What is that coordinate? Negative one comma zero, great. All right, let's finish it off strong. What is the coordinate of the bottom quadrantal angle? Good, zero comma negative one, okay? I don't care how much you dislike trig or you feel that trig is like not your best friend right now. I know you all know how to write coordinates like this, right? I know you can count and say, this is one. So I know this is one zero. Don't sell yourself short. Those are really good skills to fall back on, right? Like what we're gonna be doing today is really sort of creating the unit circle and thinking about how it came to be. And each one of these pieces, there might be a trick that you can take away so that you can help yourself really commit that to memory, okay? All right, so let's go down to this chart for a moment. We've got zero radians, pi over two, pi, three pi over two. And what do we call 360 in radians? Two pi. Perfect, okay. So. Pull up your favorite calculator. It might be Desmos. I'll drop a link in the chat for Desmos. Or it might be your favorite scientific calculator that you have at home, whatever it is. Go ahead and get that calculator. And I'm gonna ask you to um, pick maybe two of your favorite values to fill in in the table, okay? So what I mean, is that to fill in this box in my calculator, I would type in sine of zero, and then it would give me a number. Okay. So if I type in sine of zero, I get zero. Yeah. So if what would I type in to get the next box over? Mm hmm sine 90. All right, anybody have a value for that? Sine 90. One, perfect. Okay, so amongst yourselves, let's divide and conquer. All right, pick your two favorite values. Go ahead and um, find out what those are. And if you like, you can also annotate right on the screen so we can get those values in there. And let's go ahead and fill in this chart. Great, I love it. We've got a zero, we've got a one, we've got six more entries that we need to complete. I'm a bit confused. Um, when I go to type in sign and I put in the degree number, I get a bunch of decimals. Uh, which calculator are you using? The one that you gave us. Great. I tried on decimals Whoa. too. So 
So do you see the little wrench in the top right hand corner? Yes. Okay, click on that. Okay. You see all the way down at the bottom, it probably says radians. Got it. So if you want to type in radians, then you better do like sine of pi or like oh, okay. pi over two. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to use degrees, just click on degrees and then it'll change the mode for you. Okay. Thank you. And this is part of the reason why I'm like, I want you guys to try using the calculators right now because technology is something that we really need to make sure we are aware how to use, right? And this radiance degrees thing, I can't tell you how many times I'm working on something and I'm like, why am I getting really weird numbers, right? And it's only because I've been doing it for so long that I realize the numbers are weird, but it's a really good thing to check no matter like what problem you're working on, just make sure you're in radians if you wanna be or degrees if you wanna be. Great, all right. I love all the values that we have here on the screen. Those all look excellent to me, all right? So make sure that you're able to get the same value um, don't be shy. Make sure that you know you're reaching out either to me or other people in the class to make sure you're in the right mode. But we do have zero, we have negative one, zero, and then the bottom line we have one, zero, negative one, zero, and one. So that looks perfect. Looks like everyone who contributed was able to use the correct mode on the calculator. All right, but let's talk about some patterns. Okay, so. The first question I want to ask us is what does sine theta represent on the unit circle? And as I look at my, the unit circle that I have here, all right, I notice that at sine of, theta, of zero, I get zero. So let me go to that. And I realize that the y coordinate is zero. Well, I wonder if that's true for the other ones. So sine of pi over two, we said together was one. If we go to the angle pi over two, wow, the y value is one. Okay, well, let's keep going to make sure that this pattern is valid. Sine of pi is zero. And if I go to pi, the y value is zero. All right. If I go to three pi over two, is the y value negative one? Sure is. And if I get back to two pi, is that y value zero? Yes, it is. So if we were to describe in words right now, what does sine theta represent on the unit circle? What would you folks say? Great. So we can say that the sine that sine theta represents the y coordinate. on the unit circle. Great. What do we think cosine is going to represent? All right, let's check it out. Let's see if that is indeed true. So if I go back to the circle, oops, let's pick a different color. All right, cosine of zero. Oh, yeah, at zero, that's the x value. Cosine of pi over two is zero. Cosine of pi is negative one. Cosine of three pi over two is zero. And when we get back to two pi, it is an x value of one. Okay, 
let's write that out here. Cosine theta represents x coordinate on the unit circle. Right, so cosine represents the x coordinate and sine represents the y coordinate. All right. I can't tell you how unfortunate it is if you confuse these. Or perhaps I can. It's not a good thing to confuse those. Okay. So maybe for the rest of the day, as you're going about your life, secretly in your head, you're like, ah, oh, sine theta is the y coordinate, cosine theta is the x coordinate. Sine theta is the y coordinate, cosine theta is the x coordinate. All right. Whatever tricks you have, whatever sort of study skills you have to make sure that these two pieces of information are very deeply ingrained in that brain of yours will be very valuable for you, okay? All right, so working with complex fractions, all right? I said earlier that the fractions, when we divide one fraction by another fraction, that that is where a lot of folks really struggle. So I want to make sure that we talk through uh, a few examples here. Okay, so let's start off with this one half divided by three fifths. All right, the one half we keep right times, what am I going to multiply by? Five over three. Five over three, perfect. All right, is there anything I can reduce before I multiply? Because last time there was. And if not, what do we get? Perfect, right? We multiply straight across. We get one times five is five, two times three gives us six, right? Great, let's try it with these numbers. One half over root three over two. Following the same procedure I had from before, I would keep the one half. What would I multiply it by? two over root three, I love it. Two over root three, great. Is there something I can reduce before I multiply over? Nice, good catch, right? There's two on the top, two on the bottom. Great, what's my answer? One on the top over root three on the bottom. Perfect. Okay. Now, I think some of you know maybe what I'm going to be asking you to do real quick, but um, how do I get rid of that square root on the bottom? times root three on the top and the bottom. Okay, so times square root of three over square root of three. You might've heard this called rationalizing the denominator. And all that means is no more square roots on the bottom, okay? What do we get in the denominator now when we multiply through? We get a three, great. What do we get in the numerator? Good, okay. One thing that I wanna make super clear for us right now, one 
over root three. Is that equal to or not equal to root three over three? Yeah, these two, these are equal. They're equal because all I did was multiply by a fancy way of saying one. So whatever I started with is the same as what I ended up with. Yeah. Let's try one last example. Um, you know, that's a good question. I think that it's actually not always preferred. I think that in like high school math, we tend to teach it as a skill, like a skill that we want to know, but because it's like a skill, it becomes sort of more important than we think it might be. If you write this as your answer, I'm probably not going to take off points for that. But if you're if you write this as your answer and then you go check your answer with an answer key and the answer key sees this that's where it's sort of on you to connect the dots like and be confident that your answer is correct does that make sense so it's more a situation where like this is fine for me but pretty much every answer key out there does that so you just want to make sure you know that your answer is correct okay all right, so taking a look at this last example here, let's follow the same algorithm we've been doing. We get root three over two times two over one. Looks like we can reduce those twos again. What do we get as an answer here? Mm, root three, Ian, what's the denominator for that? Perfect, okay. So root three over one, but since anything over one is just itself, we can write it's root three, okay. Is one over root three the same as root three? Okay. Not equal, All right? I think sometimes we sort of panic. We were like, I'm not very good with square roots. You're like, I don't know, this has a square root of three, that has a square root of three. Maybe it's just easier if I just say they're the same, but those are not equal to each other, right? And I think it's easier to see here when I asked Ian to be specific about what the denominator was. The denominator here is one, but if we look up here, the denominator is square root of three, okay? But this also means that root three over three is not equal to the square root of three. Okay, so these are not equal. Now, I feel confident that we can do complex fraction with like, no radicals. Where I hope that we all grow to be super confident is working with radicals, okay? So that is part of the purpose of like working with fractions, making sure that we continue to grow that comfort zone that we're like comfortable with whole numbers, but also with square roots and things like that, okay? All right, so we're going to take a break right now. Um, it is 1029. So let's be back here at 10. Uh, let's say 1040 a.m. OK, and we'll come back. We'll dig into this, uh, the unit circle a little bit more, um, where we actually go through and sort of fill out all the things. And then we'll finish class with like figuring out how do we use all the things that we just created. OK, so I'll see you folks back here in about 10 minutes. All right, so 
before the break, we talked a lot about sort of the, the background of what we're going to be looking at, right? We look, we revisited this concept from last week of does size matter, all right, meant to be uh, facetious here, but thinking about all of these fractions that we could possibly have, but then they reduce. And so sometimes if we're clever about a choice, and in particular, the cleverness here is around having a hypotenuse of one, then we actually get the trig functions right from the coordinates. Okay, now without me scrolling back to the uh, unit circle work that we did earlier, four fifths right here, right? That's the cosine value. Four fifths is also the X coordinate here. And we also said before break that the Y value of the coordinate is the sine of that angle. Right? And we can see here again that that does indeed match up. All right. So let's take a look at this unit circle. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's suppose that we had this. right here. If this is a unit circle, how long is the line that I just drew? One radius, like one unit because of the radius? Yes, one because it's the radius. Perfect. Okay. Now, let's say that I wanted this angle to be theta, right? And so I draw this part right here. And then I make a triangle. All right, so we've got a pink triangle here that has a right angle and it has theta. Now, I wrote theta here, but I bet if you look back at our notes from last week, you can actually tell me how big this angle is. And to be precise, please give me the measure in radians, not in degrees. Perfect, pi over six, right? Because this was the one that if I cut one, two, three, four, five, and six, six pieces, six pieces of what? Six slices of pi, and I cut them all equally, so that's how we get the pi over six, okay? Now, this coordinate right here is x comma y, right? Any coordinate I write is going to be x comma y. And the x comes from this distance, and the y comes from this distance, the vertical one, right? So this goes back to how I was joking about how I'm not super creative with the names, but if it's horizontal, I'll probably give it an X. And if it is vertical, I'll probably call it Y, okay? Now, on your uh, calculators, if you wanted to find a value for X, what would you type in to your calculator? Nice, cosine of pi over six, good. Cosine of pi over six, beautiful. Because the way we created the unit circle, the X coordinate is the cosine of that angle, great. What would we type in to find a value for Y then? Good, sine pi over six, okay. Oops. So this is our cosine 
or our x value. This is our sine of that angle or the y value. Okay, so y and x, right? Um, which one of these values looks smaller according to the triangle that we drew? Yeah, the Y one is smaller, right? Because it's shorter than what we have here. Good, okay, keep that in mind. All right, now I'm gonna draw another triangle that has the same reference angle, right? The same reference angle. Let's do that triangle in orange. Remember, reference angle is the angle between the terminal side and the closest x-axis. So this, this angle in here is pi over 6. But can someone tell me how big this angle is? Right? In particular, from this initial side here all the way to the terminal side that orange that first orange line in radians how big is that angle it is not 2 pi over 3 that's a good guess but it's not 2 pi over 3 all right, and again, you can go back into your notes from last week, all right? We do have all of those angles written out, most of them, I think. Five pi over six, yeah. All right, so this angle is five pi over six. And we can think about it, we took five of the six slices, but not that last one. So five pi out of six. Right. If I label this X and I label this Y, and I write those coordinates here, X, Y, this distance X, how does that compare to this distance x? Ah, very nice. It's same but negative, right? So instead of saying this is cosine pi over 6, we could say that the orange x is negative cosine pi over 6. How could we describe the orange Y in comparison to the pink Y? It would be the same, but also positive. It would be the same, right? Is this one positive? Yeah. Yeah, so it's gonna be exactly the same. So we could write sine of pi over six, okay? Now we're gonna get values for these in a little bit, but I wanna talk through this idea of how we can find, um, if we know one of them, how we can find three other ones based on that idea of the reference angle, okay? So let's try for a blue uh, triangle now. This blue triangle. So we have the blue X, we have a Y, the angle in here is pi over six. But how big is the angle that starts at this pink line and in the positive direction goes all the way to the blue line? Does 
seven pi over six. Very nice. So we'll squeeze that in seven pi over six. And same thing if we said this is x and y. How can I use these coordinates to tell me about the coordinates for seven pi over six? Nice, really nice. They're, they're the same, but they're both negative, right? Because if you think about this like an xy plane, this, oops, this is negative x and this is negative y, right? So I'm going the same distance, but negative cosine of pi over six and negative sine of pi over six, right? And we've got one last one. Let's go with a purple triangle. Right, we got an X, we got a Y. What is the measure of the angle that starts at the pink line, goes in the positive direction, and ends at the purple terminal side? Good, this is 11 pi over 6. And if we think about the XY coordinates again, how do they relate to the original, the reference angle one? Good, positive x, but negative. All right, and because we go, we start here, we go positive x, but to get down to that angle, we say negative y, All right? And those are things that I think and I feel pretty confident that I'm right, that we all feel really comfortable with the idea of positive X, negative X, positive Y, negative Y. We're just putting a circle on top of that grid, but it works the same way that like when we go in this direction, it's a positive X. But if we go this way, it's a negative X, right? Or if we go up, it's a positive Y, but then down would be a negative Y. All right. So as much as like what we're about to fill in is a lot of information, there is a lot that you actually already know about it. And that's, I think, the most important to just keep in mind. I know how to graph a point. I know what's positive X and what's negative X. Like if those are things you have to tell yourself to make this feel more accessible, do that. All right. But let's get to this thing of beauty right here, all right? It's intentionally blank. I know you can go out there and find completed versions of these, but I think you sell yourself short if you look at this and you're like, I can't fill that in. I believe in you folks. I know every single one of us can learn how to fill this in, all right? And I think the more we fill it in, the more patterns we see, and the easier it is for us to sort of remember those patterns, okay? So let's start with the angle measures, all right? Let's go with zero degrees here, and we're gonna go in the positive direction. And if you wanna call them out or just put them in the chat, let's kind of go move to the next angle, all right? So what do we get for the next angle? Great, 30 degrees, next. 45, next, 60, next, 90, great. All right, next, we add another 30, great. Now, do we add 30 or do we add 15? We add 15, great. So this is gonna be 135. To get to the next one, do we add 30 or 15? We add 15 again, we get to 150, great. All right, do we add 30 or 15? 30, so we get to 180, all right? All right, let's keep going. Next one. 210, great. Next one, we add 15, right? The lines that are closer together, we only add 15. So that's gonna make this 240. And we know this one is 270. 
All right, let's fill in these last three angle measures here in degrees. Great, bigger space, so I'm gonna add 30. Smaller space, so I add only 15. And what's this last one? 330, great. All right, so angle measures, done. All right, this is worth your while to go through and take maybe two or three minutes and just write those out as many times as you can. All right. The bad news, though, is we're really not going to work that much with degrees. In fact, a lot of what we're going to do is in radians. And I want to be really explicit about this because sometimes folks don't believe me when I say it the first time. I'm like, oh, we're going to use radians. And they're like, great, well, I'll still use degrees. And I'm going to tell you that's not going to be OK. All right. So if the question is asked in radians, we want to make sure we answer in radians. And knowing how to remember this radian pattern here is another layer to this. OK, so let's start over here. We've got zero radians. What do we get for the next angle measure in radians? Great, pi over six. Next one. Pi over four. Next one. Pi over three. All right. Now I want to point something out real quick. Sometimes people think this is weird because you have a bigger denominator and then a smaller one and then a smaller one. And so it seems like if we're getting a bigger angle that the bottoms should get bigger as well. But keep in mind, this is a fraction, right? So if I'm cutting something into six pieces, each of those pieces is smaller than if I cut it into four pieces, which is even smaller than if I cut it into three pieces only, okay? So the denominators should get smaller as we go. And in fact, they get smaller one more time because we get pi over two, okay? All right. What's 120 in radians? Two pi over three. There's your two pi over three, all right? What about 135? Three pi over four. What about 150? Five pi over six. And we get two pi, all right? Top half, done. We keep going, seven pi over six. What's 225 in, in radians? Five pi over four, great. The next one. Mm -hmm. I agree. And we got three pi over two here. All right, we got three more angles. Good. If this is four pi over three, the next third is gonna be five pi over three, good. Then I believe we have 11 pi over four. True, false. 7 pi over 4, nice catch. 7 pi over 4. And the last one, 11 pi over 6. Okay. Now, last week, I said I would encourage you to memorize all the radian measures and all the degree measures. The reason why I said that last week is because now we're going to be adding all the coordinates on the outside. And I didn't want you to be sitting there being like, now I have to measure, memorize all of them. So the point of that from last week is if we know the inside, we already know half of it. Now we just have to learn the outside, okay? But it is not too late and it is important to do. And I would highly recommend that you do that before the exam next week, okay? If you find yourself relying very heavily on the unit circle, that's not necessarily a good place to be, okay? It is something that we want to know, like, how much of this can we commit to the brain up here, all right? All right, let's go through and fill in the 
coordinates. Some of them we already know. We know this is one, zero. We know this is zero, one, negative one, zero, and zero, negative one, right? We already know those four, because those are, everything is just a radius of one, right? Okay. Um, what is the number that comes after zero? This is not a trick question. One. One, great. So one comes after zero. What integer comes after one? Also not a trick question. Integer. Two, great. What comes after two? Three. Three, great. What comes after three? Four, okay. I think we've convinced ourselves we can count from zero to four using whole numbers, okay? Here's why this is important, all right? If you've ever seen a unit circle before, you know that most of the coordinates are fractions. And sometimes they just look like a bunch of fractions. And you're like, how am I even supposed to make sense of this, all right? Now, one thing, if someone has a unit circle pulled up, can someone tell me for all of these coordinates, what is the denominator? Two, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill in two for every denominator, two, 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 two. Okay, that's an important pattern to notice there. Every single one of these denominators has a, den or every single one of these fractions has a denominator of two. Okay, now we start here. I know this is the y coordinate, but bear with me. What number comes after zero? or what integer? One, okay. Does that change the value of my fraction if I put a square root on the top? No, okay. And maybe we could see that like square root of one over two is the same as one over two, right? Because square root of one is one, okay? What's the next integer after one? What's the next integer after two? What's the next integer after three? Okay. Are these equal? Is square root of four over two equal to one? Yeah, right, square root of four is two, two over two is one, okay. Well, why did I make us start counting from zero? What's this, square root of zero over two? That's zero, okay, so. Turns out there's a secret pattern that sort of we lose some of it if we reduce everything. In other words, I can write every single coordinate as a fraction with a denominator of two. And I start with square root of zero, then I go to square root of one, square root of two, square root of three, square root of four. Now these are all the y coordinates, which makes sense because this y coordinate is zero, but then I'm going up the y axis, right? So I go from zero all the way to four. 
Okay. Well, my question to you is, if I start at this angle, and then I go to this angle, what happens to the x values? Do they get bigger or smaller? Smaller. Smaller. Okay. And what happens when I keep going to pi over 4? X value gets bigger or smaller? Smaller. What about when I go to here? Still smaller? Yeah. And when I get to here, the X value is zero. Okay. So if I want to do the X coordinates, turns out they follow the same pattern, except because the X values are getting smaller this way, I start with a square root of four and I count my way back down to square root of zero. That means that pi over six has an X value of root three over two. What's the X value here? square root of two. What's the x value here? Square root of one, which we can just write as one. And this one is secretly square root of zero over two. Okay. So if you've never seen that pattern before, I think that's one that actually makes the unit circle feel like less like a jumble of things and that there's actually a pattern to them, a pattern that, as you all said earlier, this is positive at, or y, right? Y values get bigger when I go up the y axis, but when I go this way on the x axis, the x values get smaller, right? All right, so pi over three has the same y value as what other angle on the screen right now? Yeah, look at this. This is the y value, the y value of root three over two. And if I go straight across, this also has the same y value. So this y value is root three over two. Same y value. But use the same reasoning you told you gave me earlier. If this x value is one half, what's this x value? Negative one half? Yeah, negative one half. Really nice, right? Because here's x equals zero. So anything to the left of that is going to be negative. Great. All right. If pi over four is these fractions for the coordinates, what would you anticipate the coordinates for three pi over four to be? The same, except the x value would be negative. Perfect. And guess what? Pi over six and five pi over six, like, it's like I folded over the x of the y axis, it's gonna give me negative root three over two and a positive one half, right? Just think about them like x and y's. Negative x, positive y is exactly what we need to get to that point, right? Before we finish off the bottom half of this, if everyone in the chat could just send me a one, if you're feeling like, all right, this makes sense. A zero, if you're like, I don't know what we're doing or any decimal in between. So let's just do a quick check to see how everyone is feeling about things. Right, so zero being like, I'm totally lost and I'll see you at office hours or zero or one if you're like, yeah, I think I get this. Great. 
excellent feedback, no matter what that number is. It's okay. I just want to know sort of where we're at. All right. That way we can sort of consider how we get to where we're all feeling like ones. Great. All right. So <clears throat> I see a really good question in here. And I think it's actually a great time to sort of address that, which is like, where do the radicals come from? Like, it's all fine and good to have a pattern, but how do we know that we have these? Okay. So if you'll recall, what was the very first day we did? We did some special triangles, right? So this was, I think, Wednesday of last week, and you can find this in 5.4. So in 5.4, I made us go through two cases, one that was like 45 degrees and one that was like 30 and 60 degrees. So let's look at the 45 degrees now. We know that um, the reduced forms, like they all worked out to be the same. But on Wednesday of last week, I said, here's a 45 degree angle sine of theta is one over root two. And we didn't rationalize that denominator. If we were to rationalize this denominator, one over root two, what would we multiply it by? Good, we would multiply by root two over root two, and we would get, what would we get? Yeah, root two over two. Hey, didn't we just see a bunch of those on the unit circle? In fact, everywhere we saw a reference angle of 45 degrees, we get that, okay? And that's where it comes from because just by knowing the Pythagorean theorem and just by knowing Sokotoa, we found out that that sine and the cosine were both root two over two. Okay, so that's why we have the radicals in there. They're not nice triangles in the sense that the sine and the cosine are nice numbers. They're nice triangles because the angle is a nice angle. And because the angle is one we use so frequently, it became part of our unit circle. Okay. And same thing, if we sort of go down here to the 30, 60, 90, this is really only for the 30 degree case one over two, we saw that on our unit circle. Root three over two, we saw that on our unit circle. And all that comes from is if you have a 30 degree angle and you're trying to find your sine and cosine, every single time they'll reduce down to one half and root three over two, all right? So does that address the question earlier about uh, why we have all the radicals there. What part do you feel like is still not being addressed? Um, so besides like just kind of memorizing the special triangles, how, I guess, like how did we get to the square root of two or the square root of three and stuff like that? Well, that's, that is where they come from. So there's not really like a, or like that is the reason. Okay. You sound unconvinced. Well, I guess like based off of the, a unit circle, right? We're only given the radius. Mm -hmm. So how would you derive a radical for the X and Y without just memorizing, I guess, the special triangles? Oh, I see what you're asking. Okay, okay. So let's do this. Um, so let's say that we have 
a radius of one, right? And I'm telling you that this is 30 degrees. Let's be boring and label this a Y and label this an X. If I told you to find Y, which trig function would you use? Yeah, we would use sine, okay? So that means we would have sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. Or if we fill that in, we get sine of 30 equals y over one. That means that y equals sine of 30. And sine of 30 degrees is one half. So I guess uh, in order to like catch that, cause it'll, it'll give you a decimal. You just gotta kind of somewhat know what the square root of two, three and stuff like that is. And then recognize that pattern whenever it spits out the answer. I know in this situation, it's pretty easy cause it'll give you like 0.5. Yeah. But. Yeah, so I will tell you right now, I'm not a big fan of using calculators to do a lot of these computations for precisely that reason, um, because it'll give you some weird decimals, but they do like it's not a bad idea to sort of recognize what this is approximately or this one. I think this is 0 0.707 ish. This is like 0 0.866 ish. Okay. Yeah, but that's where those come from. The calculator okay, is just you. giving you like a rounded answer, so to speak. But if you write three over root three over two, you'll get the exact answer. Okay. Great question though. All right. So that being said, seven pi over six, which angle in the first quadrant is its reference angle? Pi over six, good, yeah. Because this is the reference angle and that's the same size as pi over six. So I'm gonna grab these coordinates. However, since I'm going in the negative X direction and a negative Y direction, I'm gonna make the coordinates negative. Negative root three over two, negative one half. And I can do the same thing for all of those. Negative root two over two, negative root two over two, negative one half, negative root three over two. All right. All of these coordinates should have positive x values and negative y values. What's the reference angle for five pi over three? In other words, here's my terminal side. If I want the smallest angle where I get back to an x-axis, that is gonna be precisely pi over three. So I grab the pi over three coordinates, which is one half. I keep the X positive, but I make the Y negative. And I can continue doing that for all of them. Root two over two, negative root two over two, root three over two, negative one half. All right. So a few things here. This quadrant right here, if you can sit and draw this and write down the angle measures and the, the coordinates in like less than two minutes, that's a really good place to be. Okay. If you're not there yet, challenge yourself to get there. Just the first quadrant.
these angles, these coordinates. Write them down, look for patterns. I'm sharing patterns that I've seen over the years that other students have shared with me, but you might find a different pattern that you're like, oh, this is an easier way for me to memorize it, right? But it is entirely within your power to say, if this is not working for me, let me try something else, okay? All right, so we're gonna do some practice problems. And then I'd like to take another break because I know this is very dense information, even though it's only one section, it's like a lot. Okay, so. So evaluating trig functions, okay? I wanna be really clear here that this is no calculator. All right, this is no calculator. I also wanna be really clear that on the exam next week, I will give out a blank unit circle that you can fill in, but you cannot put the unit circle on your reference sheet. Okay, I'm being really serious about this. I want us to be able to replicate that and do these questions without a calculator. Now, obviously I cannot control what you do in the privacy of your own learning environment when you turn in quiz questions, right? But knowing that these are the expectations for the exam, I would make sure that you are practicing how to answer these questions without a calculator and without your unit circle right next to you, okay? So since we are going over this for the first time, let's kind of unpack what these questions actually mean, okay? So let's start with this one, sine of pi over six, all right? You'll notice that every single one of these has a sentence frame that goes with it because I think sometimes when we know what we're looking for, then it helps us to find it. Okay, so when I say sine of pi over six, what angle am I asking you to go to? Radians, we're only talking in radians now, right? And that is gonna be great. So we're looking for the angle pi over six. Now, when I get to the angle for pi over six, Am I looking for an X coordinate, a Y coordinate? What am I looking for? The Y, great. And how do you know that we're looking for the Y value? Uh, the sign is the Y value. Beautiful. I'm even gonna color code that, like that's so important. Okay, it's so easy to say, I'm just gonna put this into the calculator. Great, I'm gonna get all these points on the quiz, but then you get to the test and you're like, I don't actually know what I'm looking for. And it's gonna make everything else that we learn later even more challenging, all right? So let's color code this and make sure we know what we're looking for. Now, I started by saying, go to the angle, right? So we went to the angle. And then once we got to the angle, we're looking for the Y value because it says sign. All right, so go back into your notes. When you get to the angle pi over six, what is the y value there? One half. Perfect. So guess what that means? If someone walks up to you on the street and says, what is sine of pi over six? You're like, oh, are you asking me go to the angle pi over six and find the y value? Because then the answer is one half. Okay, this is why when you type in sine of pi over six into your calculator, your calculator will say one half, All right? Let's try example two. And we'll go to the sentence frame first. So at the angle, 
what angle am I looking to go to right now? Negative pi over six. Yeah, we're looking to go to negative pi over six. All right. And once we get there, what are we going to look for? The y value. Good. So because it says sine, then we know we're going to the y value. Okay. So let's go back to our unit circle. I think this one is worth taking a look at. I go back to my unit circle and I look and I'm like, I can't find negative pi over six and I start to panic. But then I remember that last week on Monday when we first learned about angles, we were like, oh, well, we could do a positive one but we could also do a negative one. What were our rules about finding a negative angle. Yeah, we go in the other direction. So here's a zero. And I want to go this way. Now the question is, how far do I go that way? Which of the lines should I stop at? So Dallas is saying that we should stop here. And some of us might be asking, well, how do you know that? So this is one other way that I think about it. If it says go to pi over or negative pi over six, I find the positive one. I'm like, I'm gonna start with pi over six. And once I find the angle, then I reflect it over the x-axis. And that's where my negative of that angle is. Okay, let me say that one more time. If I wanna find negative pi over six, I go to positive pi over six. I find the x-axis and I reflect over and that will give me where negative pi over six is. Okay. So if I told you to find negative, two pi over three, where should I go first if I'm following that logic? To the positive two pi over three. Great, okay, now what do I do? Um, flip it over the x. Great, and which angle do I land at? Four pi over three. Great, so four pi over three, is another name for negative two pi over three. All right, let's try this game one more time. I wanna find negative five pi over four. Where do I go first? All right, negative five pi over four. I will end up in quadrant two, but I would find positive five pi over four first, right? Then I find the x-axis and I reflect over and it turns out that three pi over four is another name for negative five pi over four, okay? So I know last week, maybe it seemed like a small thing to be able to find negative angles, but now we can already see it's in the context of a bigger problem. So it's really important that we can find the negative angles so that we can answer questions like sine of negative pi over six, okay? So sine of negative pi over six, we went to pi over six, we reflected that over the x-axis, we got to 11 pi over six, but 11 pi over six is not our answer. What is our answer? Negative one half. Beautiful, because you got to the angle. Now you're looking for the y value, which is negative one half. Perfect. So 
negative one half. And I'm going to write this in here that this is the same as 11 pi over six. Okay. All right, let's continue on. For example, three, what angle should I go to? Two pi over three, beautiful. And once I get there, what am I looking for? Great. And we know we're looking for the x value because we have cosine now. And cosine means we got to find the x value. All right. Go to two pi over three, find the x value, and you get. That was a question for you folks. What do you get when you go to the angle two by over? Negative one half. Perfect, negative one half. All right. Try this one. Cosine of negative three pi over four. First, tell me what angle negative three pi over four is the same as. Good. Go to the positive three pi over four, and then you reflect it, and you should get to negative or positive five pi over four. Perfect. And when you get to the angle, what are you looking for? You're looking for the x value. Perfect. And you know that because we have cosine. Great. What is the x value there? Good. So negative root 2 over 2. Perfect. All right. So let me pause here for a moment. We've gone through four examples. All right. How are we feeling so far? If everyone can just send me a one or a zero or anything in between, how are we feeling now that we've actually gotten a chance to practice some of these? Yeah, I think for some of us, it can feel a little scary when I lead with so much of the story part of it. But once we get to like practicing it, sometimes things start to click a little bit more. And I think some of us are really good at hearing like the story part, but then when in practice, maybe it's a little bit, it's a little harder for us to get. So I think we got a good variety in this classroom. Okay. All right. So we've got four more examples here. All right. Two of them I filled in and the other two are blank because I want to give us a chance to say, Judy, can we try another one of these? Can we try one like this one? Can we try one like that one? And really start to practice writing our own questions. Because as complicated as the unit circle might feel right now, you can sit and write yourself questions like this, and then you can check everything on the calculator. So if you have the time to do that, that's actually a really uh, great way for you to build that confidence because you can write your own questions you can check your answer on the calculator as long as you understand the reasoning part of things. Okay. So let's try these. So we have tangent now. Can someone tell me what angle I should go to for example five? What angle? Yeah, we're going to pi over three, right? That part's not bad. In fact, I don't even have to go to a positive angle and then reflect it anywhere. It's just pi over three, okay? And maybe I could say the same thing about example six that I'm just gonna be going to pi over six, okay? 
But the question now here is, what value are you looking for? And to answer that, we're actually going to revisit something we talked about earlier today. Okay. When we looked at the pink triangle, we found sine, we found cosine. And then we found that to be our opposite side and our adjacent side. But we also found tangent. Can someone describe to me, instead of saying tangent of theta equals three fifths over four fifths, how could I describe that in terms of the coordinates? Y over X, or if you're looking at a circle, rise over run. Okay. So just to be really clear here, that answer was perfect. Three fifths is the Y coordinate. Four fifths is the X coordinate. So it turns out that we can find tangent just by saying y coordinate divided by x coordinate, or as Dallas has put into the chat, sine over cosine, because sine is the y value and cosine is the x value. Remember when we did these complex fractions, I was like, I don't know, maybe we should just brush up on these. The reason why I wanted us to work with these earlier is because we're going to need them to find tangent. Okay, so this is helpful to find tangent. All right, so here's how we describe this. If we wanna answer example five, where it says tangent of pi over three, we say at the angle pi over three, the y over x value is, and then we go to the angle and we grab the y over x value, okay? So at pi over three, what is the y value? Yeah, root, oops, root three over two. And I believe the X value there is one half. Okay, that's not gonna be the answer your calculator gives you. We gotta do a little bit of work. Root three over two times two over one. We realize the twos reduce. And so we get that tangent of pi over three is root three. I also want to be really clear. I expect to see this work here. That is a way that you can convince me that you know where the tangent came from. Okay. Because it is something I'm looking for, let's think about example six and how we can maybe model that. Tangent means I'm going to go to pi over six and I'm going to look for the y over x value. So tangent of pi over six equals, what's the y value at pi over six? Yeah. 
one half and what is the x value? Good. We can play the same game, one half times two over root three. We reduce our twos. And just like Ian said earlier, we end up with one over root three. And just like we said earlier, these two are not. Okay. So if you felt really good about one through four, but suddenly five and six seemed a little bit more challenging, it seems to me it would make sense to not really study these as much, but to make a bunch of practice problems where you feel like you wanna grow, right? And similarly, if you feel like all of this is a lot, maybe you start small and you're like, today my goal is to make sure I can do ones like one through four and feel confident about that and tomorrow, I'll make sure that I practice some of the ones that are more challenging as well, okay? So no matter what you're feeling about these six examples we've done so far, keep in mind that as we're going through these, like what feels like you need, you get it, and what feels like maybe you need to put in a little bit more time on that, totally fine to need more time to like feel like you really understand things, okay? Right. I have a question. Yes, for sure. What's up? So I know that we didn't do it for this example, but in number six, here we could do the rationalize thing for the denominator. Yeah. You could write it as root three over three. That would be okay as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And again, I think this is a great thing to say. Okay, if Examples one through six were all really easy for me. Maybe my challenge is I want to rationalize all of my denominators, right? So there's different layers um, to, you know, where you can sort of challenge yourself at, right? But based on these six examples, what, let's make up our own problem, right? Where do people want to practice? Do we want to practice sine, cosine, tangent? What do we, what do we want to practice here? All right, I see one vote for a tangent. Again, you can also directly message me. You don't need to tell everyone in the whole, you know, room, classroom, where you feel like you're struggling a little bit. All right, it seems like we've got a bunch of folks who agree that maybe tangent would be another good one to practice. All right, cool. So let's try maybe this. Let's do tangent of negative three pi over two. Yeah, tangent of negative three pi over two. All right, negative three pi over two, not explicitly on our unit circle. So someone translate that for me. What angle am I actually looking for? Pi over two, good. You're gonna go to positive three pi over two, and then you're going to reflect it across and you should get pi over two. Once we get there, because it's tangent, we're looking at y over x. All right, so go grab those unit circle values. What is the y value at pi over two? Go 
rate, what is the X value there? Great, all right. What's one divided by zero? Undefined, okay. It is okay if you have a fraction and you have zero as the denominator to get an answer of undefined. We'll see more in the next unit what it looks like to be undefined, all right? But for right now, that key thing is, well, when I divide by zero, I'm gonna get undefined, okay? So good choice of question here. We wanted to practice tangent. We wanted to practice a negative angle. Love that. We got one more example here. What do we want to practice? Ooh, okay. I'm going to say hold off on the secant. All right, hold off on the secant. We're actually going to get to that. Uh, I think you get to take a look at that in 5.3. All right, so let's save the secant. But for sine, cosine, and tangent, what would we like to practice? Okay, cool. So we've got sine of. 5 pi over 3. All right. So I'm going for the angle of 5 pi over 3. So that's the angle I'm going for. I'm looking for the y value when I get there because it's a sign. Right? So 5 pi over 3 y value. Great. Find 5 pi over 3 on your unit circle. What do you get for the y value? Yeah, negative root 3 over 2. Beautiful. All right. You can follow this model to sort of make practice problems for yourself, all right? Um, sometimes I think it's a little bit more fun to like think of problems with some of your peers, right? So you can sort of study together by just making up some problems. You know you can check your answer on Desmos. There's a lot of rich conversation about like why answers are correct versus not correct, all right? So with that, let's take our second break. All right, I'm gonna pause the review. All right, so we've talked about sine, cosine, and tangent and how to find those on the unit circle. And now we're gonna talk about um, some other types of trig functions, okay? So just as a quick review, all right, we have our main trig functions and we have those as sine theta, equals, I'm gonna abbreviate here, I'm gonna put an O for opposite and an H for hypotenuse. But just know that that numerator is not a zero, it's an, it's an O, like O for opposite, okay? And we've also learned today that sine of theta is the Y value on the unit circle, right? So all three of these are equivalent expressions. All right, if we write one for cosine, we would get cosine theta equals A over H, which equals X. And if we write tangent of theta equals O over A, we would write this as Y over X. All right, so that's just a summary of what we talked about earlier. Now, 
just to kind of plant some seeds for what you're going to watch in the first part of the 5.3 video. If we have sine, what is the reciprocal function for sine? What did we define as the reciprocal function? Yeah, cosecant, right? So cosecant theta wouldn't be O over H. It would be hypotenuse over opposite, right? But then we wouldn't be looking for the Y values. What would we be looking for? If we were looking for x values, that would be cosine. How did we get from sine to cosecant? Is it the inverse function? It's not the inverse function. Use words very carefully here. Okay, sine and cosecant are reciprocal functions. Reciprocals are not the same as inverse function. Okay. How did I get O over H to become the definition for cosecant? We took the reciprocal. So to get from Y to whatever I'm looking for on the unit circle, I have to take the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of Y is one over y. Okay. Just like we flipped the top and bottom of the fractions to define cosecant, we do the same thing with the coordinates. Okay. So for the reciprocal of cosine, what would I write? Well, let's start from the beginning. So what would I start writing? Even before that. Yeah, we'd have secant of theta equals hypotenuse over adjacent, which is going to be 1 over x. Good. Great. All right. The reciprocal of tangent is cotangent. It's going to be adjacent over opposite. And what do I do to when I'm looking for coordinates here? Yeah, I take the reciprocal of the coordinate. All right. So when we say reciprocal, we literally mean flip the top and bottom. All right. So why am I such a stickler for that word inverse? Because we use the word reciprocal to define some trig functions. And then separately, we use the word inverse to describe some other one. So if you use, oh, reciprocal is the same as inverse, that's when things start to get very confusing. Okay, so we have to be really careful about the word choice. Reciprocal means flip top and bottom of our fraction, and those have certain names. Okay. The inverse functions, which is what we're going to talk about right now, they actually give us some different information. So the inverse of sine is sine with a little minus one. And if you've used a scientific calculator, you've probably seen that button on your calculator somewhere before, okay? But anytime you hit this button where you're like sine with the minus one, here's what that means. You're gonna put in an opposite over a hypotenuse, or you're gonna put in a y value. And your answer is going to be an angle. Okay. The answer is going to be an angle. So 
inverse trig functions, we end up with a little minus one symbol. That's the part that says inverse and our answers always going to be some kind of angle. If I write a similar statement for cosine, I'm going to get cosine with the minus one. What do I put inside the first set of parentheses? Yep, adjacent over hypotenuse, or I could say inverse cosine of an x value, and I'll get an angle back out. And same thing if I do tangent, but I inverse tangent, I'll end up with opposite over hypotenuse as my input or y over x, and my answer will be an angle. Okay. So to kind of summarize that, if you have a main trig function or the reciprocal trig function, anything from the right two columns, your answer should come from the coordinates. We can think about that as we're using values from the outside of the unit circle. However, if we are looking for the inverse trig function, your answer will be an angle. In other words, we're finding answers from the inside of the unit circle. Um, that's a great question, Dallas. The answer is yes, there are inverses with reciprocals. We don't talk about those as much. I would say that these nine would be the most common trig functions that we use in practice. So yes, a reciprocal inverse function exists. Do we really use it? Not usually. Okay. It's probably a, a good thing too. I think 12 might be too many on the table. All right. So let's finish today with some examples and kind of see how this goes. Okay. So here's how we sort of approach this. If we look at example nine, Okay, we see sine with a minus one and a coordinate. Okay. This minus one tells me that my answer should be an angle. All right. But I want to find the y value, y because it's sine, and the y value I'm looking for is root 3 over 2. All right, so I'm looking for an angle that has a y value of root three over two. Go back to your unit circle. Look for where the y values, not the x values, the y values are root three over two and give me an angle where that happens. Pi over three. I agree, pi over three. Is that the only answer? I would disagree with pi over six though. The y value there is not root three over two. That's okay, it happens. Is pi over three the only angle where this happens? 120. Radians. 
Well, at two pi over three. Perfect. There you go. Um, I am so particular about the radians because I know how easy it is for us to use the degrees. And so uh, out of very motherly love here, I want to make sure that we are building that proficiency here. So you're right, it is 120 degrees, but knowing that you might not see degrees a whole lot, it's really why I want us to like challenge ourselves to work in that space, okay? I know it's harder, but I also know that if we engage in the work in that more challenging space, that we're gonna be able to do it degrees or radio, okay? All right, example 10. I see the minus one and I say, oh, my answer is going to be an angle. Then I look at like what I'm looking for. Turns out I'm looking for the y value just like last time, because it's sine. But what would I write, for example, 11? Would I put a y value there? For 11? Yeah, for 11, what would we put? Uh, an x value? Yeah, we would change that for an x value, right? So we're only choosing sine or y because it says sine right now. But if we think ahead to cosine, we're not looking for the y value anymore. Okay. Now, once we, what y value are we looking for? We're looking to see where there's a y value of negative one half. So go to your unit circle, find an angle that has a y value of negative one half. Great. Looks like we've got seven pi over six or 11 pi over six, okay, great. All right, so let's take a look at examples 11 and 12, okay? I ask myself first, am I looking for a coordinate or an angle, right? Negative one, that means I'm finding the angle. Negative one in the exponent, it means I'm finding an angle. Now, why am I doing all this color coding? Because I know this section is all about finding angles, but like on a quiz or like on an exam, it might not be that clear, right? All these questions could be mixed up together. So it's really important we know how to dissect the information that we're given, okay? So cosine, I'm looking for what color did I use? I think this one. Both of these are cosine. So for both of these, I'm looking for an x value. And in the first case, I'm looking for where there's an x value of one. And in the second case, I'm looking for an x value of negative one. All right, so let's kind of answer those together. Go on your unit circle, find angles that satisfy the restrictions for example 11. Great, I agree, zero or two pi, great. All right, what about example 12? Pi, right? And so this one, there's only one answer and that's okay, all right? One thing we're gonna learn in the next unit is how to choose which one of these numbers is correct. Okay, 
So of these two, one of them is what we say, you are correct. And the other one is, you're almost there, but not quite. And so we're going to learn how to make that decision next week. Okay. But for right now, for quiz three, I want us to write both answers down. All right, we're down to the home stretch. We've got four examples left. I know this has been a long day. And I chose some that I think were really important for us to do together um, because I think this is where things get a little tricky. Okay. So in all three or all four of these, I notice I have a negative one in all of those, meaning I'm looking for inverse tangent. And when I'm using inverse tangent, it means that I get an angle at the end for my answer. Okay, I get an angle at the end for my answer. So that part I know. I cannot recall what color I used for tangent, hot pink, okay. So all of these are also tangent. So I know that at every coordinate I'm looking for the y over x value. Okay. Looking for the y over x value for every single one of these. All right, I'd actually like to start with number 16. And for number 16, it says the inverse tangent of zero. So what that means is I'm looking for the y over x value to be zero. Okay. How, if I have a fraction, do I get zero out? By having zero as the numerator. Perfect. So let's make a note for ourselves here. This is really saying inverse tangent of zero over something, which means we're looking for where y equals zero, right? Because the numerator is y. So we're looking for where y equals zero. That's what that question is really asking us, okay? So go to your unit circle, find the angle or angles where the y value is zero. What do we get? Nice, all right. I see a zero or a pi. We don't really need to write the two pi because two pi is actually the same as zero, okay? All right, let's take a look at 15. So what's different about 15? We're looking for something, the inverse tangent that is undefined. All right, so we're, in other words, we're looking for where the y over x value is undefined. Well, we know how to get zero out if we have a fraction. How do we get undefined out if we have a fraction? Something over zero. Perfect. And those of you who have been with me in Math 116, I think these ideas, not with the tangent, but something over zero, zero over something, that's something that we talked about in one of the discussions, right? Thinking about like how we get those. And part of that was planting the seed for us to be able to answer these inverse tangent questions, okay? So find me an angle or angles where what am I looking for? What's the parallel statement here? Yep, tangent is y over x. I agree with that. If 
That's what we were just talking about. How do we get zero out of a fraction? Where x equals zero? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to answer this one, we would say where x equals zero. Okay. So we are looking for this one to be zero in the denominator. That's the only way we get undefined out. That's why we're looking for where x equals zero. All right. And I think we have those answers in the chat. We've got pi over two or three pi over two. All right. All right, so let's take a look at these last two questions here. I know the tangent ones are challenging. That's why we're doing so many of them. And I would really encourage you to redo these on your own later, okay? Redo them again. I think that the, the more times you sort of review this idea, the stickier it'll become, okay? So in number 13, what are we looking for? We're looking for y over x value, and we want that y over x value to be square root of three. And I might even write that as square root of three over one, okay? Now here's the tricky thing though. When we go backwards, somebody simplified this already. In fact, they even simplified it all the way to square root of three, and we can't look and find square root of three directly on our unit circle. So we have to sort of backtrack this a little bit. In other words, if we have a y over an x that reduces to root three over one, that is going to tell us the angle that we're looking for. I know this was earlier in our lesson, but what y over x coordinate pair reduces to root three? I have to go back into your notes for that. Nice, yeah. In fact, this unsimplified was root three over two over one half, right? And so now we're gonna look for a y value of root three over two and an x value of one half, right? And so when we go in our unit circle, we're gonna find that that happens at pi over three. But I argue that there's another angle where we could reduce to a positive root three over one. Where is that other angle? Well, I'll leave you to fill that out then on your own time. There is a second answer here though. And if we're looking at example 14 here, last question of the day, we're looking for root three over three. But earlier we said root three over three is the same as what? What was like the unrationalized form of that? Where did we get root three over three from? Uh, one over 
the root of three at the angle pi over six. Perfect, one over root three. And where did that come from? That came from one half over root three over two, okay? And so even though it's tangent, we have to break it down into the sine or the y values and the cosine or the x values to find that on the unit circle. And you're right, it does correspond to pi over six, but same argument as example 13, I claim that there's another angle where if I divide two things, I'm gonna to get to that same value, all right? So I think we're all a little bit tired, but I would encourage you to make sure you know where to find these other values. You can check with me later on Discord once you've sort of refreshed your brain a little bit. Um, but that is the end of our story for today.